Okay, I think we should start. We have already abused uh, time of our participants. I know time is precious in Brussels, so we will start. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gany Maksak. I'm executive director of Foreign Policy Council Grand Prix, which is Ukraine-based think tank uh, with office here in Brussels. We are doing this foreign policy and international security. Yes, please. And uh, today, uh, in cooperation with our great partners from European Policy Center, we'd like to talk on a very important issue from Ukrainian point of view about cooperation between uh, NATO, European Union, and Ukraine. Why it is so important, I would say that um, the interest was triggered from our side, because um, as I say, from, from, from our perspective, we have been looking at this position of cooperation on these declarations for quite a while. But uh, it was triggered by um, new initiative, which was uh, launched by Foreign Minister Kuleba back uh, in February 2023, which was called uh, Coordination Platform between NATO EU and Ukraine. So um, we tried to look into perspective of the situation and to find answers, maybe some weak points of the situation on the ground and propose some ideas because in our activity we would like to, we, we always try to be a policy rental think tank. So some ideas are already in publication. If you still have a possibility or chance to see it is uh, on the table, please uh, make, make, make um, it available for you. Uh, and uh, before we start this presentation, we'll start with our discussion. I would like to uh, give floor or to just to give floor to the host of the <laughs> of, of this event and uh, to present uh, some um, remarks of, of welcome Silan Taran, who is EPC European Post Center Research Fellow and big friend of Ukrainian Prien. Silana, please. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, honored to uh, talk uh, on behalf of uh, European Policy Center today, and I'm delighted uh, uh, to welcome you, uh, uh, our uh, distinguished speakers and our guests here uh, in uh, EPC and also online. And uh, this event is held by uh, a Europe, EPC's a Europe in the World program, and in cooperation with Ukrainian PRISM and uh, is a part of uh, our uh, EPC, Ukraine European Future Project. And I'm a research fellow at this uh, project. Uh, our project is led by our senior expert, uh, Amanda Paul, maybe you know her. Uh, and uh, uh, it covers a lot of uh, topics related to Ukraine and the European integration and uh, Euro-Atlantic integration uh, are uh, one of the most important uh, topics of our project and uh, we are conducting policy research and uh, doing a lot of uh, public uh, events and discussions with the representatives of Ukrainian government and also of uh, with prominent experts uh, and um, uh, we also cover, uh, by the way, not only uh, uh, Ukraine's uh, uh, topics, but also topics on related to uh, transatlantic integration and uh, EU NATO cooperation. And we, uh, here we have our uh, expert, uh, Mikhail Kihaya, uh, who will be talking on this, uh, presenting uh, these topics. And uh, also, we are actively uh, cooperating with. Uh, our Ukrainian uh, partners and uh, our uh, and Ukrainian Prism is our important uh, partner here in Brussels. Uh, and uh, as we are both dedicated to uh, providing analytical support uh, um, on EU policies to, uh, towards Ukraine and also to how to uh, uh, Provide providing Ukraine with long-term security guarantees and uh, and this uh, Russia's uh, war against Ukraine as soon as possible, and uh, that is why today uh, topic is very important for us and. Uh, 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 I'm looking forward to listening uh, to uh, uh, insights from your uh, publications, uh, from your new publications, and also from a following discussion uh, with our speakers on trilateral EU-Ukraine-NATO uh, uh, cooperation, how to make it a win-win cooperation, and uh, how to increase uh, Ukraine's involvement in this. Thank you very much. 
Svetlana, thank you so much for this possibility, for this partnership, and we uh, very much looking forward to uh, Mikhail's comments on the situation in, in, in this triangle, I would say. With uh, no further ado, we have uh, most of our speakers on, on panel, and uh, we would like to start, uh, this is my proposal, from a short brief from uh, Hannah Schellist, who is Director of the Security Studies Program in our think tank, Ukrainian Prism. She is one of the authors uh, of this of this paper. Um, other author, Viktor Nemiranko, is also with us. She will maybe comment on some issues on, on cyber and digital dimension of this cooperation. But we will have maybe not more than 10 minutes, OK? Just to, 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 just to, to spot some ideas which could be just of interest to, 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 to our panel. And afterwards, I would like to uh, give floor to our partners from European Union and from, from NATO ally countries just to see the base for this cooperation, maybe to talk about how they assess current situation between EU and NATO and then have to maybe to propel it to this triangle as we as we pointed out in our publication and then with our uh, good friends diplomats from our mission to 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 of ukraine to nato and with our expert we'd like to find common denominator for this triangle and i think it will be maybe a good uh, conclusion from our uh, from our um, panel if you have some recommendations post or recommendations to the cinemakers in three in three uh, dimensions for um, uh, NATO, for EU, and for Ukraine as well. So, without no further ado, Hanna, please, the floor is yours. So, what's our main takeaways? Thank you, Gennady. Um, that was really quite a uh, challenging and interesting to look uh, um, into the sphere. And the uh, title is not just to be provocative, but that was the question that we asked for ourselves. And uh, uh, if to start from the very beginning, like why we suddenly decided to write about this, because we understood that both Ukrainian, European and Euro Atlantic integration are taking the pace, uh, it's going ahead, and there are so many spheres that are uh, potentially can overlap or already overlapping, and we needed to understand what can we really do of this, how not to waste resources, at the same time, how to accumulate possibilities uh, both uh, uh, within the integration process and independently from it. And in general, to see, is it just an ad hoc cooperation between two organizations that is happening now because of the Russian aggression against Ukraine, or it is real uh, potential, uh, first of all, for Ukraine as the candidate state, but uh, maybe in the future for other countries, if this triangle uh, would work and we um, maybe one day can become an example, a sample for other countries who would uh, um, uh, accelerate uh, the integration and cooperation with these um, organizations. And uh, um, uh, that's why I'm definitely not going to go through the old pages, and I will leave uh, uh, you with, I hope, reading uh, some of the takeaways, but few things at which uh, we paid attention. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, is definitely we we'll look to the origin of this cooperation between two organizations to understand how sustainable it is from where it is coming and what spheres it is prioritized because understanding what spheres NATO and EU are prioritizing in their bilateral cooperations it gives an opportunity to look uh, to which spheres Ukraine can potentially uh, join uh, easier than creating a new spheres that can be unique just for the trilateral maybe cooperation and uh, uh, here we um, understood several things first is that NATO and EU see their bilateral cooperation in quite a different way. Uh, NATO uh, is usually care more about avoiding overlapping. So for them, coordination is probably prime word. And uh, uh, when you go to the European Union documents, you understand, uh, or the statements, they're speaking more about complementarity. And that is not the linguistic play of the words, that is the attitude, especially when you speak about the security sphere, uh, how they see each other and the potential cooperation. So coordination, you just inform each other, you exchange some information and potentially identify a few spheres where you can work together. When you speak about complementarity, it's definitely uh, a little bit more um, complicated, but interesting, uh, complex probably way of cooperating. And uh, uh, here we see that European Union is quite clear in papers that they see NATO as the primary security actor, and they would like to take other spheres as for themselves. However, 
Then, like a bit spoiler, when you go to the Ukrainian context, you understand that European Union decided to play much stronger role as the security actor, rather than uh, just going to the soft issues as it been uh, um, originally sought in even in 2014. Definitely 2014 became that year when two organizations both started to talk more about bilateral cooperation and how to accumulate their efforts towards Ukraine. When we look to the three main documents, the joint declarations that set the factor, the frameworks for the cooperation, 2016 and 2018 with the uh, uh, 74 measures uh, announced in 2016 and 2017, set a certain list of those priorities from which we can go. Because 2023 declaration is more about oversighting of what been agreed previously, not looking to the new spheres that appeared after 2022. And here we realize that the spheres that are top priority uh, is uh, um, cyber, uh, digital, uh, military mobility, Exercises, training, disinformation, uh, resilience, even that sometimes it's seen different by two organizations, hybrid threats, uh, maritime security, um, and uh, our cooperation with partners, defense industry, that's as well uh, among the top priorities, and climate change and how it influence, uh, even that for the European Union, understandably, climate change is the wider agenda than it is for the uh, uh, for NATO that looks only through the security uh, prism. Uh, later, what we uh, saw uh, in 2023, and partially we can also identify the spheres of uh, cooperation in the strategic concept and in the strategic compass, uh, both of 2022, uh, that China and Russia also joined uh, this uh, uh, list, even that we understand perfectly that they are always in the midst of many other uh, spheres that have been um, written before. I will skip now the cyber resilience because we realize that cyber is probably that sphere where the biggest amount of the interactions happening. Uh, we put it as separate. Um, uh, case study here. I'm very grateful to Victoria, and if we'll have more questions in particular about cyber and digital spheres, I hope she will uh, jump in uh, with the responses. But if, uh, for the sake of the time, to go to the Ukrainian side, uh, that's uh, um, give us quite... Um, I would say it is still a little bit of the vacuum. So we... Um, no, vacuum probably is not the very good word, but you you know... It is the feeling that you have the salad cut, but not mixed yet. Because we have a lot of, of these half prepared sometimes initiatives already like in the process of the preparation, but it is still the feeling of this ad hoc cooperation rather than strategic understanding. And why we name it a dream team or a triangle? Because we don't have the answer for ourselves. What will be the best way even for Ukraine? We understand that there are certain spheres where bilateral tracks will work better, and we don't need to uh, mix them because they have their logic, their priorities, especially when it is for the integration process. At the same time, we understand that when it is, for example, sphere of the cyber defense, why to use two different tracks? The priority is the same, the experience is the same, and that is the experience where Ukraine is sharing, not only acquiring from uh, our partners, where we can be uh, those who are providing it. Or when we go to the uh, um, military mobility, uh, the events of 2022 and necessity to bring uh, a significant amount of uh, weapons to Ukraine raised this question that previously we all talked about uh, our military Schengen. It's probably the last five, six years at least, or even more, that we started using this term. Is it possible or not? And what is interesting that predominantly we spoke about it within the European Union, not within the NATO con uh, uh, context. And 2022 and the real actions that needed to be taken to organize all this chain of logistics gave us sufficient practical uh, data uh, to speak about how to do it, what are the challenges, what are the loopholes, how to work with this. And here we perfectly understand that, yeah, even that European Union, because customs is usually the European Union issue, uh, was the initiator of this idea of military Schengen. But 
NATO is those who are de facto deciding about all this logistics chain and helping Ukraine. So it is impossible not to have a proper dream team uh, cooperation uh, setting how it can work for the future, um, both inside of uh, the European Union and others. So that uh, sphere is definitely uh, something about what we are talking. Uh, hybrid threats uh, or the disinformation, that's also where we can speak about the dream team because what we noticed within the different researches that we had uh, uh, with the Ukrainian prism, that uh, it is the same narratives that Russia and China are promoting and it is usually very similar and they are overlapping between the EU and NATO. They have this collective West. So why should we have just a triangle relations or something like this? Training. As well, we have a quite a significant efforts, I mean, military training by the European Union, by NATO, and that is the question that we need not just to avoid overlapping, but to see how we can use the resources of both in the best way to have um, the big amount and the most effective of uh, training happening. Um, defense industry, that's the question is that here we understand European Union is investing a lot now in this sphere with the better funds, but at the same time, it is NATO who are de facto client, those who would put the plans for what we need, this defense industry. So from the Ukrainian perspective, that's again the sphere where we would like to see better cooperation and uh, luckily from February 2023 we have these uh, uh, high-level meetings, the new trilateral format that uh, can allow the um, dialogue on the issue. And uh, uh, the last but not the least is definitely the question that we are raising it is the requirements that both organizations are setting for Ukraine for the integration. And we understand that now when we're in the process of um, drafting the adapted annual national program, as it are uh, called the new document, de facto, uh, for Ukraine NATO cooperation, we need to look to the, I cannot say mistakes, but the weak places that we had probably previously, uh, when you had the requirements of the Europe, of, or association agreement or for the candidate status, you have the requirements in the ANP. And some of them, when you speak about judicial or anti-corruption sphere, they definitely uh, can be similar. And here the question is for us now, how to create this triangle? And that is the way where we're probably speaking about triangle, trying to uh, avoid duplication of requests, first of all, to understand priorities of two organizations, but at the same time to think about the wording, to avoid the double reporting. Let's be very practical and pragmatic, because sometimes just because of the a little bit different wording, even if we speak about the same issues, um, we need to report twice on the same and just to have extra efforts that um, uh, should not be taken. So the question for us definitely will be to identify these spheres and to learn the lessons uh, from the past. And I will not speak about, but for those who are interested, we try to take those 74 particular measures that the European Union and NATO uh, drafted. Some of them, honestly, were very interesting for me, why you would put it in such a like sm small thing in the plan. Uh, you will see that we put it here only 54. The reason is that some was really uh, like to organize uh, some exercises in 2017 or 18, and there were no sense like to, uh, to analyze them there. And we try to see where, in which particular measures Ukraine can join or have the potential to be uh, involved. Honest. Thank you so much. Um, I think it was a good flavor of the paper. We still encourage you to take a deeper look at the information which was provided. And thank you so much for the team of the paper for this uh, thorough uh, tabled attention to different tasks and directions of cooperation. Uh, with this, uh, as you mentioned, 74 were both in uh, 2017 and 2019, you said? 16 uh, and 17. 16 and 17. 17. Yes, yeah, okay. So uh, if I may, just before I present our panel and uh, give the floor to them to deliver, to intervene, I'd like maybe to give you uh, as well some uh, like home assignment. What are your preferable three or five areas out of these 74 for cooperation maybe in triangle, where there is untapped potential or where there is uh, uh, or where there is uh, cooperation, but still it needs to be mended or some, some, somehow fine-tuned. Uh, fine With this, we are going to our panel discussion, and I'm happy to present our distinguished panelists. Um, let's start from 
that end. Uh, we will start from M Mikhail Kihayev, Post Analyst, European Policy Center. We have with us uh, Oleksiy Genchev, Councillor of uh, Mission of Ukraine to NATO. We have with us as well Bart Shevchik, with a um, senior fellow of the German Marshall Fund of the United States in Brussels. And we're still expecting uh, to, to join us by um, Klaus Welle, Academic Council Chairman and Wilkie Marsan Center of European Studies and former Secretary General of the European Parliament. So I think it is a good and balanced panel to look from three sides on this situation, from transatlantic, from European perspective, from Ukrainian side. So, uh, Mikhail, let's start with, with you, with, with, with your perception and with your take about this basis, current cooperation between EU and NATO, and what areas, as I asked, uh, maybe of essence, of more importance for you in your personal list of priorities for this possible triangle. And one more question, which is more political. Uh, if you're talking about strategic approaches of both EU and NATO, uh, could you spell your assessment about strategic compass? Is it a relevant document since it was uh, elaborated in times prior to big war, prior to February 2022? And uh, it was, it, it was uh, adopted in uh, March 2023, but main work, the grant work was done before that. So is it the right document to go ahead for both organizations and to streamline this cooperation? Please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for, for having me for, for, this, uh, for this event. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation of the, of the report. I have quite a few um, specific areas that I want to, to jump into, but maybe first I'll, I'll go into the, the Yanadi's question on the, on the strategic compass. Uh, of course, the strategic compass was, uh, well, adopted in 2022, but it was still in the making for about a year and a half before. Then we had the, the, Russian, uh, the Russian invasion. And then, of course, it was beefed up. So there are many points that where the language was, uh, was adapted, including military mobility uh, and many others. Now, the question is whether it's still, uh, still valid. I mean, of course, it's, it's still valid. There are many deliverables there that will increase you know, EU's uh, stance on security and defense. Now the question is what will happen in a few years from now on, because we'll have a new, uh, a new EU legislative, we'll have a new, a new commission. So they might feel the need to, to adapt this and take into account more um, the war in Ukraine and the lessons learned from Ukraine. So I think this is, this is definitely possible. It might be on the agenda to have a, a revision of the compass. Now the, the issue is how long this would take, because it cannot take again two years, right? To, to have it. It needs to be a process that is much faster and swifter. And here, of course, there is a question of, uh, of political will and also of understanding between, between member states. And now, more on the EU, NATO and Ukraine cooperation. Uh, I think I want to focus on, um, on three areas. Uh, first is military mobility. Uh, second is uh, maritime security. And third is, uh, is missile defense. Uh, I'm not sure if missile defense was in the report. I haven't seen it, but I think it's an area that also um, is, is relevant in EU, NATO context, in cooperation with Ukraine, and also outside of these, of these frameworks. But I'll come to that in, uh, in a minute. Uh, going back to, to military mobility, um, as you said, uh, Anna, uh, after the, the Russian invasion, there was this impulse at the EU level to, to focus more on, uh, on military mobility. And we see this in the strategic compass. We see this into a new EU strategy on military mobility. It's actually a 2.0 strategy uh, on it. Uh, of course, before this, um, there's also the PESCO project on military mobility. And there we also have a US, Canada, UK, and Norway uh, participating. And then, of course, military mobility is also a flagship project for EU NATO cooperation, probably is, the, is branded as the most important, where cooperation uh, is going very well. And of course, military mobility is also important in the context of uh, NATO's new regional plans, which basically um, detail how um, different forces react in case of an attack. And of course, military mobility is essential here. Of course, these regional plans will be tested for exercise, and there is a lessons learned exercise how to improve military mobility. But here, uh, the EU is essential because basically the EU is, uh, is, is regulating uh, the most important aspects of military mobility, which is the transport infrastructure, the protection of infrastructure, uh, the customs, 
and other issues. Now, I think this focus on, uh, on military mobility also highlighted what is, uh, what is lacking in this, in this area. And of course, um, what is lacking is the, state, is the state of the infrastructure, which is by far not at the levels that it's needed to sustain such deployments. Then there is the issue of, of funding, of course. The EU has dedicated some funds to military mobility. I think it's 1.7 billion, but this is far too little to cover all the needs uh, in the EU. Uh, then, of course, then there is the issue of uh, protection of critical infrastructure. And of course, the EU has emphasized a lot on, uh, on, on cyber risks, risks, for instance, but there is also a physical risk. How do you protect the, the critical infrastructure from missile attacks, for, uh, for instance? And then last but not least, there is the issue of political will. Are the EU member states you know, willing to dedicate resources to, to advancing military mobility? Now, of course, you're wondering where Ukraine fits in in all this uh, debate. And I think there are a couple of avenues. Uh, one is uh, the connection between the um, EU transport infrastructure with, with partners, with Ukraine, with Moldova, for instance. And here, uh, the, the EU has announced that they are looking into building an, a railway that will connect uh, Lviv to Romania, to, to Chisinau in Moldova, to, to Odessa. This is a very relevant uh, project because it will connect Ukraine to uh, TNT, the transport, European transport, uh, transport network. Then secondly, um, I think the lessons learned from Ukraine, military mobility is happening in, in Ukraine. It's been happening since uh, February, 2022. And there are a lot of lessons learned from there that will undoubtedly help uh, the EU for the future. Uh, then of course, there's the question how they can share these, these lessons learned because there are limits of, of cooperation. I think you mentioned in the report, there is of course the issue of exchange of information, which is, uh, which is sensitive. Well, one option could be to actually create a center of excellence, for instance, on military mobility, a EU NATO one where Ukraine would be invited as well and some lessons learned could be, could be shared. Uh, then I would move a bit into the um, maritime security um, issue. And I think here it's important to look um, a bit also at the Baltic Sea, but also, of course, at the at the Black Sea. And I, I'm sure probably you've uh, you've heard um, last week that there was an attack on a pipeline connecting uh, Finland to to Estonia. And this is a very relevant issue: the protection of maritime critical infrastructure. And of course, a year ago we had the attacks on on Nord Stream. Um, one and two, and now we have multiple attacks because it's not only on the pipeline, there are also some telecom cables. And this, I, I think here, um, the EU has been, uh, has been reactive, of course, after the attacks on Nord Stream, uh, everyone at the EU level, they were like, oh, this is an area we haven't paid attention to. So of course, there is a need to be also proactive, proactive not only reactive to uh, uh, to this. And it also shows that the strategies that have been developed since a year ago have not really worked so far. But the Baltic Sea is not the only sea that is very important. There is also the Black Sea, which hasn't received um, significant attention uh, in, the, in the past 10, 15 years. I mean, it started to receive more attention after 2014. But still, at NATO, at, at EU level, there isn't much because this is treated mostly at, at, at NATO at NATO level. And I, I think here, uh, the NATO and EU have failed to discuss a, a strategy, a strategy at NATO level, but also a common, a joint strategy. Now, the, the big question in the Black Sea is how to ensure deterrence on long term. It's, of course, there is, we have the situation now, but we also have to think four, five, 10 years in the future. So how can we ensure this, uh, this deterrence? Then, of course, one way would be to, uh, to coin a Black Sea strategy, a strategy that I know there are many difficulties there, but I think it's, it's important in this strategy to put emphasis on, on partners, to put, of course, on Ukraine, on Moldova, on Georgia, and how these partners would be involved in implementing such a, such a strategy. Then there's the issue of protection of critical infrastructure. That's the issue that I mentioned uh, in regards to the Baltic Sea. Here, of course, um, EU and NATO created this task force on protecting critical infrastructure, but, but more can be done, especially with regards to maritime critical infrastructure. And then there's the issue of exercises. Of course, more exercises are needed in the, in, in the Black Sea. 
there was also an idea that was floating around, I think, around 2015 about a, a regional Black Sea fleet. But that idea didn't, uh, didn't go through. So maybe an option would be to revisit it. And also, I think it's important to look again at lessons learned from, from Ukraine. There are many lessons learned in, in terms of naval warfare in the Black Sea that must be taken in. And, and last is the, the role of, of regional formats that I think need to be underscored further. And here I mean, of course, Bucharest 9, Three Seas Initiative. And this gets me to my, to my last point, and I'll, I'll finish there, which is uh, missile defense, which again became, uh, of course, very relevant um, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we've also had the Sky Shield initiative proposed by Germany that rallied around, I think, 17 countries uh, so far. Uh, there are also disagreements, of course, with other European countries, such as France and Poland, but I'm not going to get into that. But here, I think there is an opportunity to, to align this, this framework, the Sky Shield Initiative, which is outside of NATO and EU frameworks, to align it with uh, the NATO Integrated Air and Missile Defense Network. And then also it could be connected to the EU efforts to finance missile defense technology through European Defense Fund. And, and of course, here, uh, there is another added layer which comes from, from Ukraine, which is, again, the lessons learned because the missile defense systems have been tested in Ukraine. So there is a lot of things to, to learn and also to explore how to, to integrate, potentially integrate uh, Ukraine in this shield, this sky shield that European countries want to, to create. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, good, good list, good top three priorities, mobility, maritime security and missile defense system. So now we move to other end of our table, of our panel. I would like to um, give the floor to Klaus Welle, Academic Council Chairman of Field Smart Center for European Studies and former Secretary General of European Parliament. Uh, Mr. Klaus, uh, I asked all our participants, all our distinguished panelists to uh, draw their own top three, top five of areas for cooperation of, in this triangle. Mm -hmm. But mainly, or let me also address you with the question of political will on European level. Just uh, building on your experience, robust experience in, in understanding the politics and institutional capacity of European Union, is the will to act on equal footing with NATO in security area? What's your point on that? Yeah, thank you very much. And first, mm, the only excuse I have for coming late is that I was in another debate on Ukraine, <laughs> just 300 meters down the road, and uh, the, the schedule had changed, so I could not be here in time. Yeah, I would like to say the following, because the question is bilateralism, trilateralism, that's in your, uh, that's in your uh, paper, and I think it's very interesting that you list up all the areas where there's already a kind of cooperation, but we can also see that this is very much on expert level. It's not on the big uh, political issues. And my experience has been um, previous function, but also before that whenever it comes to highly political issues, then a formal cooperation NATO European Union becomes extremely difficult. The main reason being Turkey, or uh, we could also say Turkey Cyprus. And uh, therefore, you are very quickly at, uh, you're meeting very, very quickly your limits or, you know, partners ask for other things to be connected to, to the issue. And this is why I think this has largely failed. Um, does it therefore mean that, um, you know, this, this cannot go well together? Uh, I think I can, it can go extremely well together because we have seen during uh, the Ukraine war de facto, uh, European Union and NATO have become complementary in the area of security and defense. Um, because the European Union has been able to do things that NATO was is not able to do, and NATO is able to do things that the European Union is not uh, able to do. Um, and I like to cite in this context always um, a book, which is about uh, the weaponization of everything, so modern warfare is not just about tanks and weapons, uh, but it goes into many components. And we have seen Russia using basically all of them, uh, trying to weaponize food, trying to weaponize 
energy and threatening us that uh, you know we would have a very cold winter or that our industry would be uh, would be destroyed. Uh, weaponizing refugees, uh, millions of refugees, and the response in all these areas was an EU response, including a very generous acceptance model for Ukrainian um, refugees. And let's remember that also the last major wave of uncontrolled migration uh, uh, was the direct result of Russia bombing Aleppo and Syria. So the last two major refugee movements have been created by Russia, very much, by the way, to the benefit of parties who feel close to Russia, which is a bit uh, ironic, but I think it also should be, it also should be said. Sanctions regime, 11 packages of sanctions, European Union decisions. And last not least, hope, which is very important uh, in terms of um, integration into the European Union and uh, a mid and long term perspective for Ukraine. So even though this is not the outcome of joint meetings, uh, arrangements, uh, institutionalized relationships, de facto, in the area of security and defense, in a modern way, the European Union and NATO have become complementary in a war situation. So does this inform us also about what is ahead? Or is this a one time in an extreme uh, situation? I think, to put it, uh, let's say, boldly, uh, the European Union or let's say European Union action is the precondition of the European members of NATO to be uh, an equal partner and to be delivering in NATO. And why am I saying this? I'm saying this because, A, uh, for the moment, we don't have a functioning internal market on uh, defense. In principle, yes, but de facto, uh, the exceptions are so widespread that we cannot scale. So we are producing Leopard 2 tanks like it would have been done in the 19th century with, uh, uh, you know, by hand manufactured, but not scaling, which means it's far too expensive. There is this uh, reference also that we have, because we are divided, more than 160 major systems, the Americans have 30 plus. So we are not scaling, we are too expensive, and therefore, it's a rough estimate, um, but I think there was some years ago a paper by the Cost of Non-Europe Unit in the European Parliament, which outlined that about we are paying about 30% too much. So either we could save 30%, or we could have 30% more capacity for the same money if we were to organize a proper market, internal market in defense. That's what I mean with the European Union being an essential precondition for members of NATO to deliver. Um, transport and logistics has been mentioned. We now have a budget line, which was severely cut by the member states in the last MFF. But I hope that in the next MFF, this is, a, this is a key topic. This is a key topic for a key priority for the member states. So because we know the most um, likely scenario of the EU directly being threatened is an attack on the Baltic states. So how quickly can we deliver material up there? And if the transport infrastructure doesn't function, the answer is we won't. So uh, the third point, uh, internal market production capacity, to scale, transport and logistics. Fourth point, research. If I'm correctly informed, there's now a budget of, I think, 1 billion in NATO for research. But if you compare this with the research capacity in the EU budget, uh, it's very little, you see. So if we were to think about something like a European Union DARPA, which could finance research with, uh, you know, Ws, civilian and and military, that would put us into a very different place. And again, have very positive effects for NATO because the Americans already before the war were complaining that scientifically, technologically, very difficult to go into a war situation with the Europeans because they are technologically very advanced and we are not. So we have to catch up. Uh, another benefit we could bring. Five, 
also in these situations you need functioning civil protection services there uh, there is a concept which was elaborated by michel barnier uh, during the presidency of jean claude juncker of the european commission which hasn't put into practice number five what the european union could do number six strategic gaps so there are a number of strategic gaps which weaken us on the European side, uh, definitely in air transport capacity, also in satellite, also in, uh, also in intelligence. Um, we also have to work on this. So um, I'm, I'm currently coordinating a project in the Martin Center, uh, which I've called the European Defense Pyramid, where I try to argue that we have to get into the area of defense but like this, not in the traditional way you would think about it. Uh, we have to create the basis for functioning European defense, especially given that the Americans will have to focus more on Asia, on China, and will ask from us to be delivering more on the conventional side. Uh, and we are publishing this. I've written the white chapter. There are nine other chapters which are written by real experts. Um, and I hope we have something available at the end of the year, which could be interesting for the debate. What shall we do in the next legislature and what needs to be done in view of the next MFF? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Weber, for such a comprehensive list of uh, issues which uh, are already on the radar of European Union, but also which need more attention. And I think that some of them uh, also shared by Ukrainian experts while we're looking at the situation from, from our angle, from our lenses. So now it's logic to see um, uh, from transatlantic perspective. So now I would like to uh, give the floor to Bart Shevchik, who is a senior fellow from German Marshall Fund of the um, United States in Brussels. Um, Bart, you've heard about European uh, state of play at the moment. Uh, from other side of the ocean, what is the perception about this cooperation of NATO and EU? Is it equal in some parts, or there should be still batteries by big American presence here in Europe? Great. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate on this distinguished uh, panel. Um, and I was totally playing with a number of different uh, titles for or subtitles for the paper, and I wondered whether Dream Team or a Bermuda Triangle <laughs> uh, might be a, a nice way to juxtapose the, the two, um, two potential paths in your relationship to both institutions, the EU and NATO. I'll maybe give, offer some sort of high-level thoughts about uh, how, to, how to best think, in my view, uh, about the two institutions. But maybe uh, let me sort of jump to my bottom line uh, recommendations that I think are relatively practical and you could explore uh, whether it would help or not is a different question. But one is, uh, and I'll, I'll sort of explain why I think this is this might be a good idea, um, notwithstanding everything else I say. Uh, but one uh, thing that you could consider is actually joining up the embassies or the missions that you have to the EU and to NATO. Uh, that might help with some of the kind of practical you know, reporting logistical hassles that you flagged. I don't think these are the, you know, the biggest problems that Ukraine is facing right now, but it could simplify the life of, for some officials. I think it would actually be even a better idea for the existing member states, both of uh, the EU and allies within NATO to join up their missions, because I, I do agree with Klaus and Mihai. Um, and 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 Hannah and Hanai uh, in the report um, that you know it is very useful to think about potential synergies between the two institutions, um, even though they are quite different. But the way I would uh, think about those synergies is from the vantage point of the member states, because that's uh, at heart where the action is and will where the action will remain, in my view, for the foreseeable future. And I'll explore uh, expand a little bit on that later. Now, the other uh, concrete proposals that I want, wanted to offer, um, in addition to joining up uh, missions between the EU and NATO, uh, would be, and just to expand on this a little bit, um, the basic uh, theory of the case is that if you have a single individual, the single ambassador who represents a country, Ukraine, Poland, Belgium, whoever, 
uh, to the two institutions, that individual mind can, you know, be the repository of all potential synergies from the vantage point of that particular country uh, between the two institutions. And to the extent that there are synergies, and I think there are, uh, that, in my view, is the best channel to, to facilitate that analysis, that underlying research, and that underlying decision making. The second uh, recommendation I wanted to offer is that, you know, now that you have the NATO Ukraine Council, and I would try to figure out, I'm not, you know, sort of uh, an expert on the internal workings of NATO, but I would try to figure out ways to leverage this new institution as much as possible. Uh, it provides for, you know, regular meetings at the leaders level, at the ministerial level, both sides could uh, convene or call to convene the council. So it's not just a prerogative of NATO and NATO uh, allies, but also of Ukraine to convene a meeting. Uh, and one way that I would explore uh, leveraging this new mechanism is on the very specific issue, but which could actually have quite practical consequences. And that is, it turns out that for uh, defense companies uh, that are based in NATO countries, uh, who want to hire Ukrainian staff, they cannot do so because Ukraine is not a member of NATO. Now, you would think that given, you know, the four plus million Ukrainian refugees who reside in the EU, in Poland, Germany, Romania, elsewhere, and who would want to be hired um, in any capacity, especially in the capacity can, that can help uh, support the war effort in Ukraine, but that should be a relatively uh, straightforward thing to do. But there is a, a blockage based on NATO rules currently that prevents defense companies from doing so. I would try to figure out ways to, you know, put it on the NATO Council, NATO Ukraine Council agenda, and you know, drum up uh, the public debate to try to change this because you have defense companies who are who want to hire, you have Ukrainian refugees who want to work, uh, you know, and if there's only a, a legal rule that makes sense for many other cases, right? You don't necessarily want to hire um, citizens from any third country, you wanna have some robust security clearance procedures and so forth. But for uh, Ukrainian refugees who want to work at uh, NATO defense companies and NATO based defense companies, they should be able to do so. Now, uh, with those very, uh, sort of uh, concrete and, uh, and practical recommendations. Let me offer just some high level thoughts of how I think the best way that Ukraine should approach the two institutions is on separate bilateral tracks uh, <laughs> through a joint ambassador to both institutions. And that is because for all the work that's been done at the EU level in terms of rhetorical commitment, in terms of money that's been allocated, in terms of you know, cooperation within the Council of the EU on political and security affairs, including on defense projects through PESCO for those countries that are participating in it. You know, um, there's been a lot of work. I, I served in the European Commission during the uh, under President Juncker, and a lot of this work was launched during that period of time. But it's been sort of uh, marginal steps, you know, uh, seven years hence, notwithstanding an existential crisis now in in Ukraine. And, you know, people will have different explanations for why that is the case, why there hasn't been a greater kind of centralization of effort at the EU level and, uh, you know, why they're um, notwithstanding you know, the 90 billion euro that's been allocated overall between the EU and, and EU member states for Ukraine support. You know, this is a massive amount of money uh, in terms of the, you know, the military aid and the weapon supplies and so forth. That's been still um, a, a smaller fraction of the overall contribution from the West. I think fundamentally that what the EU does or does not do by way of incentivizing cooperation among member states or not, um, member states ultimately within the EU will, for the foreseeable future, uh, make decisions based on their own considerations of how much resources they want to uh, allocate to what projects uh, and where they want to allocate troops. 
and that basic sort of underlying dynamic is not going to shift uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and you see that, you know, in terms of what uh, EU member states have done over the past 18, 19 months in Poland and the Baltic states, defense budgets have skyrocketed, you know, in Poland, something like three and a half, four percent plus. Uh, likewise, for the Baltic states, smaller budgets, smaller GDP, to be sure, but, you know, a uh, much greater effort. And, you know, in uh, other member states in Germany and, and, and in, in France, a commitment to increase as well, but it hasn't been as as dramatic. Um, and notwithstanding the, you know, the commitment by Chancellor Schultz to spend um, uh, or to allocate 100 billion euro to a, a defense fund in Germany, you know, the actual spending has not dramatically increased for the time being. Now, Germany is a larger country and so on and so forth. But my fundamental point is, uh, and I, I think there's the evidence to prove it, is that EU member states are going to make these decisions on their own, uh, based on their own internal constraints and logics and so on and so forth, with a, you know, a, a common understanding of the, of the strategic landscape, but they will make different decisions and they will make those different decisions regardless of how much specific subsidies or incentives the EU provides or not. Uh, in other words, there was probably, you know, um, even greater overall uh, defense effort on the part of the individual EU member states uh, when the EU's role on defense was very limited uh, than, than there is now. And you could see, sort of see the overall defense spending to, to verify it. And so I think the fundamental point to remember is that both the EU and NATO um, in the areas of security and defense and even maybe um, you know, wider uh, foreign policy are primarily fora for member states to get together and decide. And in that sense, you know, uh, the late Richard Holbrook used to joke um, about the UN, you know, people criticize the UN that uh, it does something or doesn't do something, you know, it fails to act, it fails to deliver peace in country X. And so his response was that, you know, blaming the UN for, uh, for what happens in the world or doesn't happen in the world is sort of like blaming the Madison Square Garden for the way the Knicks play, the, the New York basketball team uh, plays in the Madison Square Garden. And his fundamental point was that, you know, the UN is like a, a forum for uh, member states to get together and the responsibility falls on them. You know, so the Security Council doesn't decide now on the Ukrainian conflict, not because, you know, the staff of the Security Council of the UN or the Secretary General of the UN, but because, you know, Russia will block or China will block any sensible resolution in the Security Council. And there's a fundamental division um, between among the P5. And that was by design. Within, so, you know, within NATO, uh, that is very much the case. And I think people kind of appreciate that you know, the secretary general of NATO is very much a secretary uh, more so than, than a general. But I think within the EU context, because the EU does a lot on everything else, on, you know, sanctions, on funding uh, research programs through the Horizon program, on funding transport infrastructure, on figuring out how to harmonize regulations uh, in transport to provide for military mobility. That's you know, at heart why it's a EU project and not a NATO project because regulatory expertise is, is you know, what the EU is good for. The EU does a ton and is a supranational actor on a lot of policy areas on common agricultural policy, which will be a big boon to Ukraine once it's eligible for those funds. Um, but on you know, core security and defense policy, it's still very much driven by member states. Um, you know, if let's say there's a new mission that's set up by the Council of the EU, um, let's say in, in Mali or uh, wherever else, then the question is, okay, who's going to provide troops for those, uh, for that mission? Who's going to provide funding and so on and so forth? Uh, and then you see, a, you know, some countries are willing to provide uh, those those resources and some uh, countries are not. And so uh, I, I think this fundamental dynamic uh, is going to remain. Uh, 
Now, it might be the case that at a certain point, uh, EU member states decide, no, we are moving to centralize these efforts uh, at the EU level. You know, uh, Radek Sikorski, the, one of the members of the European Parliament, has offered lots of ideas on how to uh, set up a, a European army, or if not a European army, Euro European foreign legion, that would be commanded by the Council of the EU, and the Council of the EU would decide by qualified majority voting. If that is created and constructed, then it's a different ballgame. But until there is that big shift, and there are clear obstacles to having that big shift, I think we will be in a situation where uh, the member states decide, and the member states, you know, are for the most part uh, the same between the EU and, and NATO. They're basically twin institutions for 23, 24 uh, member states that they have in common. And the biggest difference between the EU and NATO is that the United States, Canada, um, uh, the UK and Norway are part of NATO uh, and not part of the EU. But, you know, the way to think about uh, sort of different sort of things that you want to achieve with both institutions is what do you want to achieve with Europeans as Europeans or what do you need to achieve with a wider community, wider transatlantic community uh, that would include Canada, um, the UK, Norway, and, and the United States. And it is still the case, um, and I think the Ukraine, uh, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and, and the ongoing war in Ukraine has, has shown this, that, you know, um, for better or for worse, the United States has still remained kind of a, an inseparable uh, security guarantor uh, for Europe and, and, and now for Ukraine as well. I think if that were to go away, let's say if Trump, uh, um, hopefully not, but if Trump wins next year, you know, that would be a, a, a clear uh, game changer. But I don't think it would be a game changer where all of a sudden uh, Europe and European member states would, would be able to kind of fill the gap. And so, you know, I, uh, I hope that scenario doesn't come to pass because it's still very much the case that the bulk of the weapons are are still produced in the United States. Uh, even the United States is now now starting to run out of some of the ammunition to to um, provide for for uh, the Ukrainian troops. You know, some of the high end technology, the Patriot missiles and so forth, uh, the javelins, um, all the high tech weaponry and so forth, has been provided by the United States. Now, obviously. You know, nothing is, you know, all that can change, but I don't see it changing um, with either EU NATO declarations or of joint uh, cooperation. And I don't really see it changing within the EU in the foreseeable future. And so if I'm a policymaker and I'm betting with the reality that I have, I will deal with both institutions on a separate track and I will centralize that effort. Uh, just as, you know, there's one, President Zelensky, that deals with both institutions and uh, the individual leaders, I would have one ambassador kind of command efforts uh, with respect to both institutions as well. Thanks very much. Right, thank you so much. Uh, a lot of issues uh, been mentioned, uh, just maybe ad hoc uh, case, which was already um, visible on the level of some EU and NATO allies, that in Central European um, defense companies, some Ukrainians were hired to to just to fill uh, fill the gaps with with uh, workforce when it comes to to ammunition produced for for Ukrainian needs. So maybe just as as a moment which is could be amplified in in future and maybe just give the proper legal basis for that. Um, let's see. Uh, Definitely. Now we are moving from um, experts to current practitioners in this in this area. So uh, we have preserved a special role for you in this in this way. Maybe listening to all these ideas and top uh, areas we have designated. Please uh, share with us what's on uh, current plate of uh, Ukraine mission to NATO and basically. Uh, in, in what way you could share this information because I understand that some 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 process are going just uh, in, in tested way, but uh, what would be your recommendations or would be your outline how to cooperate in this trilateral format? And one more question: Are you ready to run the joint mission? 
to, 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 to European Union and NATO? Yeah, the floor is yours. Express my gratitude to European Policy Center colleagues. I'm very happy to see Svetlana Taran. And of course, to Ukrainian Prisma, Gennady and Anna, I'm very happy to see you in even free, more frequent uh, manner. Uh, as I'm working for Ukrainian mission to NATO, my voice um, can be very obvious, uh, but uh, I'll try to be uh, more precise and to keep impartiality in, in, in today's uh, discussion. The question uh, about the role of Ukraine uh, at NATO and EU tracks is not a uh, new one for me, at least. In the beginning of my career as a public servant, I, I, I raised a question to myself, uh, what the way of um, national development is better to, to, to integrate to EU first or to, to NATO first? And uh, now there is no need to answer. But for that times, um, I decided that uh, NATO integration would be a secured way to, 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 to gain the European uh, membership. And uh, the, the uh, argument was very clear for me for the time because of the security environment, because of the uh, protection of the state, the investment climate would be more attractive and uh, European values uh, could be reached uh, in more easy uh, way. But uh, probably uh, it is not the time to, 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 to talk about uh, mistakes and faults in the past, but uh, Ukraine somehow uh, skipped uh, that way of uh, development. And in the middle of 2000s, uh, the uh, Euro-Atlantic integration uh, has been moved even not to the second place, but somewhere to the end of the list. And 2010 just put a, a, a very uh, big point on this matter when uh, under the presidency of Yanukovych, it was taken a decision to, to, to follow a new uh, way of uh, national development as such as uh, neutrality. And that was the biggest mistake. And uh, the results of uh, 2010 uh, decision we are uh, watching and uh, reflecting uh, today and uh, starting to do this uh, in 2014. Uh, I do remember the times when the state entities uh, had in their structures uh, international departments divided in some sections, and it was a joining uh, attitude to keep EU and NATO uh, under one roof. And it was a huge disbalance on focusing uh, on the state on state activities and actions. Uh, when I uh, turned back from my first assignment in, in NATO to Kyiv, it was uh, 2015, I decided to, uh, to, to assess or evaluate the uh, current status for, for the experts in public administration responsible for the EU integration and for NATO integration. And the results were mm, very, very sad. Uh, we had a huge number of the experts in European integration and like 25 persons for the whole uh, Ukraine responsible for NATO business and mainly, of course, from the MOD and general staff. And there were, there were absolute misunderstanding and misreading what NATO is about at the time, what NATO was about. Uh, Unfortunately, Ukrainian state entities uh, accepted EU and NATO first as uh, um, contributors or donors for any financial possible assistance, for any possible assistance in terms of uh, 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 missions abroad, in terms of uh, exercises and workshops. But there was no any understanding that first EU is to, uh, to, to, to reach 
values in in in, um, uh, in the spheres like economy, uh, so, so social um, strengths, uh, fighting corruption, and so on and so on. And NATO is about uh, strengthening strengthening defense capabilities and uh, uh, gaining the interoperability with armed forces of uh, NATO member states. That was uh, the uh, the big very big gap in 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 our historical development in Ukraine. And now today uh, we have uh, two strategic goals: uh, EU membership and NATO membership set in our uh, constitution. And there is now an understanding that we have to follow two parallel tracks, and not to combine it, not. To, to avoid substitution of, 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 of the principles in gaining the membership, but to keep a um, uh, parallel uh, path. And uh, I think uh, we are on the right way to, to have kind of a triangle or whatever it could be called, dream team, uh, okay. But for me, very interesting how um, uh, NATO or EU member state, uh, states uh, 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 accept uh, the, uh, these two, two organizations. How do they uh, try to com to avoid the competition? Because the, the main principle of uh, um, comple complementary uh, attitude sometimes uh, seems to be a competition, at least for a non-member state or non-EU member state representative. And I do not want to be at this place, uh, thinking uh, how to uh, how to uh, compete with uh, these both organizations to uh, to to, tis, to satisfy uh, uh, any task, tasks. Uh, I think uh, it is very obvious that uh, the country cannot have two ministries of defense or two ministries of foreign affairs or other uh, state uh, entities uh, which will, which could be responsible for the EU and another one for the NATO. It is the, the only one ministry responsible for both businesses. However, at the level of diplomacy, at the level of diplomatic representation, I think uh, it is very important to have a very separate uh, a very separate units responsible for uh, each of the organization. And I'm sure that the NATO or EU um, member states uh, will will um, agree with my point. Um, I see the uh, the 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 uh, space for cooperation with NATO and the EU, and it is uh, quite similar with uh, what has already been said here. Um, I can say that there are a number few. Uh, of um, uh, interactions that are um, look like very uh, efficient in the in the manner of um, uh, its management. I can uh, mention resilience, for example. We are awareness uh, NATO will conduct the uh, resilience meeting at the level of uh, senior officials on seventh of uh, November. And the representatives from the EU institutions are welcomed and invited to, to participate in this endeavor. Also, uh, it was mentioned about cyber. Cyber is also a very global and very strategically oriented um, way of cooperation. And I, I see the uh, efficiency in this and critical infrastructure protection as well. But I cannot say that the uh, separate military uh, activities uh, can 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 be uh, can be managed and maintained in a very efficient way. For example, the recent um, uh, MELEX uh, military exercises conducted in Spain in Cadiz just a few days ago they show that NATO is not uh, uh, even involved in the process purely European uh, military exercises without any uh, possible uh, transatlantic scenario. But the war uh, or uh, military threats 
are not about the region. The Kremlin, Putin, they opened the box of Pandora, and uh, now we, we, we see the uh, consequences. We see the very negative results of what he did in uh, 2014 and then uh, last February. All the regional conflicts uh, assembled into one very big uh, global threat. That is why I think that the military operations, military planning, defense planning, and what is the most important deterrence are the core principles that NATO can provide. You can uh, supplement in this sphere. Of course, uh, somebody cannot uh, agree with me and can argue and all the opinions uh, can, can, uh, can be on the table. But anyway, it is my personal uh, perception point of view. Uh, also, I can see the, uh, the real necessity for Ukraine to, uh, to establish or to improve its capabilities in defense industry. And here is the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the space for mutual cooperation between the EU and NATO to support Ukraine in this, uh, including uh, military mobility, including the procurement system, including the uh, transparency and accountability in, <clears throat> in, 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 um, uh, in this very specific area. Uh, and here, I, I would like to, to recall the, uh, the note about the refugees that can be, uh, should be hired by, uh, by in, uh, industries in the EU member states, uh, including the defense industry. Our main goal, of course, to gain the victory, uh, to uh, restore the peace in Ukraine, and to bring uh, refugees back to Ukraine, and to create the uh, platform where you, Ukrainians that are currently in Ukraine or that are going to, 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 to get back to, to their uh, homes uh, uh, would see uh, the possibilities for them to, to, to be hired in Ukraine with the relevant salaries, with the relevant um, uh, style of, style of li uh, life and, and so on and so on. Uh, and here is also uh, the, the uh, mutual possibility uh, for both for NATO and for, for the EU. Uh, very important to uh, to follow also the bilateral track, because you know the uh, NATO uh, it is unfortunately uh, the very first um, uh, principle to support Ukraine in terms of uh, responding to the uh, Russian aggression is provide Ukraine with non-military support, and all the military support is provided to Ukraine is. Uh, has been performed by bilateral means or in, in, in the format of um, a contact group, uh, so-called format of Rammstein. And the EU definitely uh, can, can, can um, facilitate somehow uh, these processes, including the delivery, including the uh, creating additional hubs for, for transportation and so on. So uh, very, uh, a very common endeavor, but uh, a little bit uh, parallel in separate uh, in separate way, I, I, I would say. Uh, indeed, uh, we we established uh, within NATO a new uh, approach for having the uh, political dialogue. Uh, for us, it is uh, very indicative that we have such a uh, such a possibility. We call this uh, uh, new approach uh, NATO Ukraine Council. Uh, which is to, to replace the uh, NATO Ukraine Commission format. And the, uh, the main uh, difference for, 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 for this approach is to be equal at the table. And uh, uh, today, uh, Ukraine is having a, a seat uh, between the UK and between Turkey, non EU member states, but it is not about today's topic. Uh, and we have the equal rights to, to vote and to, uh, to share our uh, opinion and to be not a guest uh, for briefing and reporting and answering the questions, but uh, to be a, a full member uh, uh, at the room uh, rising 
very specific questions uh, and to, to advocate uh, our national interests. But uh, having in mind that we, in the, in the end, we will, we, we will have a consensus or a compromise. So for us, it is like a, the first, very first step to feel ourselves uh, as a, a member state. And it is like a training uh, mode, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, the first- yeah, Maybe yeah, the last point, you might just go jump in. Okay. Uh, it was uh, actually the, the, the very last point. Uh, so uh, Ukraine now uh, see, sees the uh, EU and NATO as the triangle for its uh, training mode to be in the, in the end uh, the full-fledged member of, of these both organizations. And I'm very, very happy that these discussions already started here despite the uh, despite the uh, information um, background despite the war despite all the difficulties that we have to overcome in our reforms agenda and so on thank you for your attention Alexis, thank you so much many very important issues uh, and it's always a pleasure to have you uh, with us in discussion because uh, being a diplomat you still have uh, quite straightforward look on the situation on the ground when it comes to integration both to EU and NATO on the on this stage of uh, our preparations. Um, dear friends, we are like running out of the indicated in the program time, but I would ask for my permission from our host just to extend for it, but we start um, later. And uh, we mentioned somehow, Alexei mentioned also cyber as a sphere where we could also somehow see for synergies maybe uh, i would like to ask for a comment uh victoria amelianko which is co-author of this paper uh, victoria what is your lessons learned of this triangle in cyber do you see it still it has potential to develop maybe you can take restroom yeah mm -hmm. just two three minutes maximum Thank you, Hennadin. Thank you for a wonderful discussion. Just from my side to add a bit on cybersecurity and cyber defense, it is the case that can already we can start from this to build this and to see how triangle cooperation can work. Because first of all, cybersecurity and cyber defense is priority dimension for the EU, for NATO, and also for Ukraine. And there is a space where actors can already exchange the best practices and also see how they can strengthen their cooperation. So as it was mentioned, here Ukraine can not only learn, but also to share some best practices. And we may see that EU and NATO both are well engaged in this policy, and they have established, um, have mentioned also this dimension in their joint communications and strategic documents. But most important, 2023, there was established uh, the task force for resilience. And within this task force for resilience, cybersecurity and protection of critical infrastructure uh, have been described as priority, and also where EU and NATO now try to um, have interoperability in the standards and also to complement efforts of each other. But at the same time, this task force for resilience mentions Ukraine as the example how critical infrastructure can be protected and what practices can be learned and applied in the EU and NATO. So we can see how already this triangle cooperation can add more value to bilateral tracks because bilateral tracks with the, the EU and with NATO in terms of European and year integration, they are also well designed in cybersecurity. EU and NATO have been the main partners to support Ukraine's cybersecurity, modernization cybersecurity ecosystem, and also have added lots of um, different initiatives and financial and material support. And uh, apart from cybersecurity within the protection of critical infrastructure, we can see also the separate track. Second track is actually emerging and developing technologies. This is also the priority for both the EU and NATO, but also for Ukraine. We can see that the EU has its hub for innovation in defense. We can see that NATO has, its, has established its Diana uh, Defense Innovation Accelerator and also a fund for in, in, innovations with 1 billion of funds. So that's pretty huge priority for both actors. And at the same time, we can see how Ukraine tries to develop its military technologies and also apply them already at the battleground. So from one side, Ukraine can share the best practices and negotiate, discuss with partners. But at the same time, 
partners can apply and test military technologies at Ukrainian battlefield so that to see what can be changed, what can be added. And that's why uh, it comes for artificial intelligence, it comes for new drones, for operation awareness systems. So that's very important. We can see how technologies and also cyber front line are playing actually one of the major fronts in Russian aggression against Ukraine. And to summarize, it also we can be mentioned in the paper within the proposals, cyber exercises, and also exchange of experience, cyber trainings. Uh, so there are platforms for engagement, as we see with the task force, as we can see NATO-Ukraine innovation uh, dialogue that was also established this year. We can see EU-Ukraine cyber dialogues. So in order to avoid duplication and in order to avoid um, not complementary and like integration of different standards in, in Ukrainian cybersecurity system. At this point, cybersecurity and cyber defense can actually be the area where to test and to see how interoperability and complementarity can be achieved within three actors. Thank you. Thank you so much for just uh, filling the gaps in, in, in our uh, very wide agenda. Uh, with this, I would like to open our floor for questions, uh, short comments. Please uh, raise your hands and address issues of, yes, please. Mike, please. Thank you so much, uh, Dmitros Kurko, National News Agency of Ukraine. It was mentioned uh, the security guarantees uh, for Ukraine. So that I just uh, want to know what is uh, the synergy uh, between EU and NATO in a vision of uh, these security guarantees could be provided uh, to Ukraine. And uh, the, um, Next question, if I may, you know, uh, this is a new issue, but uh, there is always a problem of balance between the security and democracy, including in Ukraine and including in EU, so that uh, we see some kind of processes inside EU and we can see some processes inside Ukraine, which are contradicting the, how to say, the common democratic trends. So that because the war, uh, it has its own uh, rules and uh, they, uh, the war, unfortunately, changing somehow all, all our societies. So what kind of guarantees can we find together, uh, EU and Ukraine, to avoid that backsliding in democratic uh, processes? Thank you. Whom you want to address this question? Metro? Whom to address this question? Everybody who gave. Yeah. Uh, there was also a question from from uh, lady. Yes. Can we just pass the mic? Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. I'm Elena Lazaro from the European Parliament's Research Service. Nice to see many of you who I know. Um, two questions. One to Bart. I mean, the idea of having a joint ambassador, EU NATO, and and missions, etc., is sounds nice. But practically speaking, we're not even able to have NAC PSC meetings at the moment because of reasons that many of us know. So I just wondered, you know, how you factor that in uh, and, and how you would see a way around it. And to Ambassador Genchev, nice to see you again. I remember early on uh, after the Russia's initial invasion, we had you online at the time of COVID at EPRS, and it's nice to, to see you in person now. Um, Yes, your idea of um, uh, the EU facilitating and NATO facilitating joint arms deliveries, if I understand correctly, you're saying everything is happening bilaterally, but um, how would you practically see this happening in a situation where I would argue the EU and NATO internally themselves are also still in the process of developing multinational projects? I mean, we have high visibility projects at NATO, they're still you know, a number of them still haven't actually started or materialized yet. We have PESCO in the EU, but that's still, you know, in the in the stages of being operationalized, much as we may read. Uh, so I wondered, you know, if that is, I, I see the value of what you suggest, but from your perception as a non-NATO, non-EU state uh, diplomat, do you see these two organizations at the moment having integrated so much in defense that you think that's feasible? Um, and the final thing, maybe, sorry, I had two, but one very last thing about, because I found it very interesting, the comment of Mihai about 10T and uh, transport and mobility, and uh, Klaus Weller also talked about this. 
I mean, we're talking now about staged enlargement, which is a very of, of Ukraine to the EU, which is very interesting. We don't know what will happen, but there is this idea of countries which are in the waiting room, let's call it in quotation marks, joining certain parts of the acquis before they actually join. And of course, there are areas that offer themselves for that. And, and would you see the area of transport and infrastructure, transport infrastructure, TNT as, should we not have you know, obviously accession will take time. Is this some an area of policy that you think should be part of this key research? I think we can already assume will be, but uh, but it will be interesting to hear. Thank you. Brilliant. All all panelists have their own questions. This is, this is very good. Uh, is there anybody else to volunteer with questions? If not, we will try to answer. Maybe uh, let's have it uh, by volunteering, right? Yeah. Hannah? Let me start. Yep. Uh, going to the metro questions, but first just reminding because everybody uh, stuck to the embassies, uh, but uh, our, the question is that we have Vice Prime Minister on European and Euro-Atlantic integration. So we have this, and we have governmental office uh, where uh, um, Alex, you've been working. He was sh shy to mention that we had this experience. We know what it means, the cooperation with an under one. And uh, uh, de facto, it is the single person who knows what is happening both there and there at the top level, at the level of the vice prime minister. So at the level of the embassies, uh, Ukraine it seems to me even had for the certain period of time. Uh, the, uh, it was with Belgium and like, I mean, we had the here, early, yeah. Early. The, the the ideas and usually it always means that one of the tracks are losing and we see it now uh, uh, in uh, uh, Vienna for uniting UN and OEC for example and the one because it is like international organizations it always that one is in the priority and other in uh, not it, it just maybe psychology or managerial issues but unfortunately you, you can unite it only at the governmental level uh, because you are implementing the same reforms or similar reforms in your career coordinating your ministries. But when it is the abroad, it is becoming more complicated uh, because also international organizations would like to see the respect to them, that they have a personal attachment and personal um, uh, attention probably. Uh, that's why it, it's happening there. If we speak about the uh, uh, balance and the security guarantees about uh, which Metro said, first of all, it seems to me that the uh, uh, process of European and Euro-Atlantic integration themselves are the certain uh, guarantee to balance uh, between the necessity uh, to continue with the democratic past reforms and uh, what we have, because uh, in case we are backsliding, that is immediately what will be on the radar of the European Union, for example, for our requirements for the European integration for those uh, uh, terms and conditions that are set. And that means that immediately we have problems in the dialogue. The certain chapters will not be open, for example. But the same with the NATO, because if you remember the old, for example, ANP, they were always um, not chapters, but sections, let's say, that are purely about the democratic uh, process, about the good governance, yep, about the, uh, the spheres that are not within the defense and security uh, sectors originally. So uh, uh, we already see it that on the one way that is the understanding from our European partners, like, uh, but at the same time, they don't want to allow us uh, not only to find excuses, but also knowing that the democracy uh, is not straightforward. It always can be backslide even in the European Union or NATO member states. That's why it's better to uh, keep an eye and oversight even in times of war, uh, because that's always the risk of um, certain um, challenges or developments. And the guarantees, it seems to me that as for now, we are not speaking about the real guarantees, neither from EU or NATO. Maximum words that we are hearing is commitments. And uh, the best guarantee is membership. And that is the certain understanding in both organizations that the best uh, guarantee is uh, our membership. And the question is how to 
uh, persuade that that means that these decisions should be taken and that this pass is inevitable and uh, undiscussable, uh, not only in negotiations with Russia, but even for the uh, domestic discourses. Uh, th that's why no, no other ways that can be put. But the commitments, that's what we need now, that what can be done now, not waiting for tomorrow uh, uh, for, for the membership. And those commitments we see within the G7, within the NATO, um, the final declaration at in Vilnius, and uh, but we definitely would like to see more, especially in terms of the uh, defense uh, supply. Uh, and very brief uh, about Ukraine uh, uh, joining some a uh, key. Uh, what I remember in transports, they are already on this path since the beginning, because when we needed to establish these new routes for export, our Ministry of Transport initiated a lot of processes exactly on how to join um, a different European Union uh, uh, mechanisms and schemes. Uh, so they were, were naming it de facto integration, because uh, uh, to use the solidarity lines and for the smooth transportations, you already needed to consider many of the issues. So. Uh, um, that wasn't the agenda uh, for transport. Uh, I don't remember the exact norms. We can find it because Ministry of Transport was very open, but they were really the first one who joined this process. And the second was the Digital Transformation Ministry, if I'm not mistaken, because all the single roaming, for example, discussions or uh, during the digital market. So they, they are trying to do it through the market um, uh, approaches. Uh, and then definitely you need norms to be adopted, to be included. Thank you. Um... Um, just to say uh, thank you for raising the question about democracy, because that's what it's all about <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, the European Parliament has been working with the RADA for more than 10 years. And already before the war, it was quite difficult to convince um, that minority rights are essential in a democracy. And that if you're in government today, the likelihood is quite high that you're in opposition tomorrow. So it's also your, it's also mutual uh, interest. Um, since the outbreak, then when I was still in function, we've supported the RADA to, to keep it going with a lot of IT material, armored cars, whatever. Um, but I think I could also witness that the quality of the process, um, let's say in a war situation is, can be, let's say can be in danger. And therefore we have to be uh, very attentive. So, and I think in the process of joining, this is together with the rule of law and corruption, this is probably what will be most looked at, very often the most underestimated. And I found it interesting that uh, Ursula von der Leyen in her Globsec speech <coughs> proposed what has been called uh, staged enlargement here, but, as a delivery first uh, uh, from the applicants, rule of law, fighting corruption, reforming the justice system. So no longer chapter 23 at the end, but something that has to be focused on upfront. And I think objectively at the end of the day, at the end of the day, many issues will be difficult. We've seen how the agriculture part can be difficult, but the key question that existing member states and the European Parliament will, will want to know uh, is, there, is, is the rule of law guaranteed? Um, is uh, the justice system functioning? And is this a functioning democracy? And if there are any doubts on any of the three, enlargement will not happen. So that's why I would like to say thank you for raising the issue, because sometimes it can be forgotten behind all the technical issues which have their importance as well. Thanks very much, and thank you, Elena, for uh, very probing questions, you know, not to dwell too much on the on this proposal of joint ambassadors, even if you don't have a NAC and PSC joint meeting, which I understand you wouldn't because of Cyprus and Turkey, I think the value would be in having a single individual in Paris and Berlin and in Washington and London, sort of thinking about, okay, how do we engage uh, through NATO and how do we engage uh, through EU channels to accomplish common foreign policy objectives. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think there might be some downsides to it. You, you're right that, you know, each institution probably wants to have a, a separate ambassador uh, logistically, you know, you would have to combine staffs, 
uh, for specific countries, you know, in the diplomatic core, it's nice to be able to have additional posts to be able to distribute. Um, nonetheless, I think there, are, there might be some value to, uh, to this proposal in a way to eliminate any potential uh, sources of competition uh, between the two institutions, because in the end, you know, you have something like 23, 24 member states in common. Uh, it's a single president, single foreign minister, defense minister that attend these sessions. Uh, and, and so I think um, having that joint up effort at the ambassadorial and then staff level uh, could be useful, although, you know, nothing, nothing is perfect. I think one to, to your second question, how the EU can help with the Ukraine contact group, defense contact group, one way would be easy would be to finance some of the weapon supplies, even if they come from the UK or uh, or the United States. And I think right now there are still restrictions on uh, EU funds being spent on non-EU uh, arms suppliers. And But that would be big, you know, if all of a sudden, let's say, you know, the US Congress is still searching for a speaker uh, weeks from now and somehow there are funding gaps uh, that the US has to be able to finance additional weapon supplies. If the EU would come in and say, you know, don't worry, we will gap fill uh, this uh, for the time being and provide, I don't know, 5 million, 10 million, you know, it doesn't have to be huge, 100 million for uh, the next shipment of ammunition or whatever it is, uh, that would be, you know, a pretty big contribution. And once the precedent is set, then you can build on it and because you've overcome the underlying uh, political constraints that have prevented that from happening thus far. Um, I'll turn it over to Mihai, not to belabor that point. Maybe um, yes. Thank you. Uh, I share the point by, uh, already expressed by uh, Anna regarding the security guarantees. Uh, definitely the best security guarantee, the membership in uh, NATO and the EU. Uh, but uh, uh, regarding the uh, possible support and facilitation, I mean the uh, first number one, uh, administrative support and facilitation. You know, the in EU, EU institutions is the biggest uh, generator of uh, legal acts and EU member states uh, just following the rules and procedures. And uh, I would like to, to give you just few examples, uh, what kind of challenges we met and what kind of um, uh, difficulties uh, the EU member states uh, faced with. Uh, for example, it was announced that uh, the, the, the amount of 1 million of ammunition would be provided to Ukraine. But then it was uh, found out that uh, there are uh, very uh, serious restrictions to uh, to produce and uh, uh, deliver in a time uh, the such an such a, of amount, and we understand that there were procedures, there were uh, legal acts, but written in the peaceful times. And uh, here is also the role for the security compass and strategic concept. Uh, for example, strategic concept is about 10 years of strategic period, uh, the, the future development of NATO. And such kind of um, uh, strategic doctrines or documents should also uh, recognize the threat of real war and uh, the necessity to, uh, to review the legislation and uh, procedures uh, to, 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 to keep the uh, uh, mobility and possibility to provide immediately uh, to, the, um, uh, to the needed uh, state. The same was in NATO. Uh, when uh, NATO um, Support and Procurement Agency uh, started to, to, to the process of delivery and procurement, we faced with the procedural timeline of 12 months, starting from the uh, competition to the uh, delivery of the, uh, of the supply to the point of uh, the destination. 12 months, what does it mean for the country which is under the war conditions, 12 months? Tens of thousands of lives, uh, dozens of thousands of facilities of critical infrastructure and the territory. And who knows, maybe uh, the, the, the freedom. So uh, 
that is my uh, biggest point for possible facilitation and support, of course. Uh, I cannot agree that uh, the United States um, have uh, difficulties uh, with uh, funds and monies. They have uh, challenges with uh, taking decisions and uh, uh, gaining the voices in the Congress. But uh, I see also the, uh, the, the element of uh, complementary uh, of the EU to support NATO and their end actions. Um, yeah, so I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, maybe very shortly, two two points from my side. Thank you, Elena, for your uh, for your questions. I, I would just to add on the NAC PSC question. I think it's important also to highlight the the relevance of informal exchanges and especially informal exchanges in a neutral setting. And I, I remember when I was at GMF BART, you put together, I think, a meeting between NATO and EU crisis management people, right? That was back in 2019. And one of their... Um, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I think one of the, the, the reflection that came out was they, they, they don't meet often enough to, to, to exchange. So that's... That's, I think, it's, it's relevant as we look forward, especially when thinking about the role of, of think tanks and neutral platforms. Now, secondly, on, on the question on connecting transport infrastructure, I, I think I would see it both ways, in a, in a sense. Of course, it's also in view of an accession process, but also there is also the immediate importance of connecting the transport infrastructure with countries that are closer to the, that are close to the to the EU, and the problem with this is uh, is basically this railway. It's not necessarily about building a whole new railway from zero. It's just aligning the the, the gauge of the the width of the of the track, and this is an issue that's also uh, we also uh, face in the EU. For instance, when you go to the Baltic countries, so I would see it in both of these dimensions. Thank you. Thank you so much. At this point, I have to uh, thank all of our distinguished panelists for great ideas. Uh, Hanna, for briefing on this paper, what I see discussion is ongoing, and we see that on three ends, we have some possibilities and some uh, issues to resolve. But for Ukraine, it is, I think, very important to see complementarity uh, between EU and NATO. The more aligned and cohesive policy is between two, it is for us better to be the third partner in this process. And definitely, it is more and more evident that from a just uh, consumer, we are uh, evolving into contributor of security and contributor of some ideas for future uh, security architecture. So I think this is the good start for our discussion. Let's hope that in nearest future we will see more time-wise policies on both sides, on EU and NATO, in, in, in support of Ukraine. But uh, on this point, we um, are very great, to a to great extent, appreciating your support from, from partner support to Ukraine. And we do think that only in solidarity, in unity, we could have this upper hand in war uh, right of Russia against Ukraine. So we will prevail, but we need this solidarity. Thank you so much. And let's have a round of applause for our panelists.